happy to uh, welcome you and we'll turn the program over to the chair of our committee, which is in charge of this event, Jessica Morgenthal. So it's thank all you, yours, Jessica. And thank you, Pam and Lori and Donna and uh, Lisa Roberts and all of the WJC staff and leadership that makes all of us uh, a better place, in a better place. So welcome all. Um, it's wonderful sharing this time with you, this space with you, envisioning our Jewish future together. I'm Jessica Morgenthal. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of Westchester Jewish Council and a chair, the chair of our sort of reformulated uh, Jewish Visioning Committee. And um, we welcome you to a whole new, a whole new space, uh, envisioning the future of our Jewish community from a crazy time. So we're excited to bring this event to you. Uh, Dr. Wimmuller was scheduled to speak actually live. I'm not sure how many of you knew about that, but um, live in April, and we're thrilled to have rescheduled and re-envision this evening in response to our new COVID-19 reality with all new issues and all new opportunities. WJC's truly amazing staff has been delivering valuable programming and resources to our community during this challenging time, bringing us together around many immediate issues and being the central communicator with so much information out there, uh, we're in, the, in, in an, an optimal place to serve that role. Uh, we host, WJC hosts our signature roundtables, countywide celebrations and memorials, offers all kinds of support for things like virtual fundraising, security and safety, the customer experience in virtual space, and too many others to even list. So tonight we move to a more strategic space the 10,000 foot level where we creatively and curiously begin to imagine together a Jewish community in Westchester that is inspired by silver linings, opportunities for new relationships and partnerships, new organizational and financial models, and so much more. Following this kickoff event, we're gonna be inviting you to all join us in exciting new programming around building our future together. We hope you'll join us. You'll be hearing from us through newsletters and directly through email. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Stephen Winmuller, Ra Rabbi Alfred Gottschalk, Emeritus Professor of Jewish Communal Service at Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles. And I have to say his title is actually significantly longer than that, but that'll do for now. Uh, Dr. Winmuller's research interests focus on American Jewish political behavior, Jewish communal social and economic trends, Jewish public policy and leadership and organizational theory and practice. Prior to his work at HUC, Dr. Winmuller served for many years in prominent leadership positions across the Jewish community, across the nation, across the globe. He is well recognized for his extensive writings published in Jewish and general publications and books on a, on a wide variety of Jewish issues, domestic and international. Dr. Winmuller holds a doctorate in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania and is author of hundreds of articles and two books, all available on Amazon. Honestly, his life's contributions have been extraordinary and no short intro can do justice to all the good Stephen has done for our Jewish community and our world. On that note, I welcome Dr. Stephen Winmiller, our new WJC visionary in residence to offer his insights on our new reality and to help us to envision a stronger tomorrow. We will hear from Dr. Winmiller for about 30 minutes and then he'll be answering questions from the audience. Please type your questions in, I'm sure everybody's been on Zoom now for a while, so there's a chat function. So please type your questions anywhere, anytime along the way into the chat box for everyone, and we'll be consolidating them, the, um, the staff and, and I will be working on them, and we'll read the questions to Dr. Lynn Miller, and he will answer them, as many as he can. We will conclude our program at 845, and welcome Dr. Lynn Miller. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be with you and to Lisa and to Elliot. Um, congratulations on the extraordinary work that you are delivering to the folks of Westchester County, to the Jewish community and beyond. And to Jessica, my appreciation for that warm and very welcoming introduction. Uh, indeed, I was scheduled to be with you in person so this moment, in a sense, is reflective of the new realities that we are facing. And in some measure, the ideas that we had propositioned to present in an earlier point have been fundamentally disrupted and changed as a result of these last eight weeks. So this evening, I think we'll walk through some of the core issues and trends 
that I believe are significant to the American society as a whole and to the Jewish community in particular. I would ask Lori or Pam to now move us to the next slide. I think the immediate realities that we are living with will suggest a fundamentally new place, a new normal for American society and will have profound impact as well on our own community. It is actually a bit early to be able to project exactly how the American economy, our social, political, and economic systems will evolve from this moment. But what we are clearly aware of is that we are moving into a fundamentally different kind of society and experience as a result of COVID-19 and its impact on our lives. One very clear and certainly ominous outcome is the notion of conspiracy and the use of hate and anti-Semitism, both directed against Jews, the state of Israel, but also directed against our neighbors, Asian Americans, immigrants and others. This is an important rec recognition as I believe we need to understand uh, that in the anxiety, fear, and uh, the focus of what is happening, hate and hate conspiracies have become a piece of the story that we will be uh, telling as we move forward. In certain respects, this moment in time uh, reinforces what we have already been seeing uh, over a period of years. Certainly the rise and importance of technology, this very program is a kind of uh, tribute to the notion of virtual community and to the idea and the power of doing so much more in terms of our economy, our social networking, and our non-for-profit uh, philanthropy work through the use of this technology. This reality will stay with us and it will grow to become increasingly important as we move beyond COVID-19 and as we see our society move forward. I believe that the economic story will be certainly a fundamental one that will have many different components to it. The immediate displacement of many in the workforce, the sense of closure that we are seeing in terms of industries and businesses, and the reality that even in our sector, the nonprofit world, we will see the downsizing and shifts uh, taking place. But at the same moment, we are also seeing the emergence of new American heroes, the first responders and so many others who have been significant to our society at this very moment have become ultimately a part of the new culture of America as we shift who and where we find those that we respect and consider important. The trend lines in terms of charity and volunteerism are interesting. In the immediate 10 weeks of this process, Gallup is suggesting that while charitable giving is down and volunteerism for sure has taken a nosedive, the reality is that many folks are fundamentally shifting their charitable priorities at a moment where there are new realities the issues of food security, the questions of hunger and homelessness, the issues associated uh, with job displacement have become the new and immediate priorities for many of us and for many in the larger society. The political fallout as well is reflected in study after study in terms of how we see or how our country sees the virus from two perspectives again signaling the bipartisan or difficult partisan uh, characteristics of American uh, politics at a time in which the virus itself is the centerpiece of uh, public affairs and governance. The exciting news that affects many in this community, synagogues and other parts of the faith uh, community, are the reports in both Pew and Gallup of the emergence in our society of a renewed increase and interest in faith, the participation in worship, the experience of studying religion and religious ideas in a time in which many people are feeling degrees of anxiousness and uncertainty and where faith and community have become uh, new uh, 
and a significant voices in the shaping of the American uh, story. The next slide. I think we all know that there will be a second wave and maybe more. And what we are certainly conscious of at this moment is the impact of all of this on our various economies, the economy of the nation, more directly the economy of our community in terms of its ability to meet the needs of the institutions that we support and cherish. But it is also the story of American democracy and the test that we are seeing between those who demand the right to return to work and the concerns that many have in terms of the importance of abiding by medical and scientific voices in our society. And this tension between individual rights and the collective responsibilities is a major test for our democracy and is certainly a core question of how we will pursue and be pursuing governance of this nation in the future. Many believe that there will be some degree of civil unrest. Indeed, we have already seen in various Midwestern states expressions of that unsettled behavior. But this could go deeper if the economic impact of the coronavirus is uh, itself more penetrating. 25% of Americans are expected to lose their jobs and up to 44% of uh, various minority groups, including Hispanics, are reporting uh, that they are unable to support or sustain their families uh, during this uh, uh, period. So it is increasingly an economic crisis that could and may see some expressions of behaviors on the public square in terms of reactions to government, to industry, and to community. We are also witnessing a generational pandemic as Time Magazine has suggested, which reminds us that the behaviors we are beginning to see of millennials and Generation Z constituencies is reflective of what we saw in the 1930s in terms of the Great Depression and the behaviors of our grandparents and great-grandparents in terms of how they responded and lived their lives after that particular moment. From 2008 at the time of the recession, now 12 years later to the 2020 coronavirus, we are seeing particular patterns unique to the two generations I've described, the Generation Z and Millennial, in terms of their economic behaviors, patterns of their lifestyle and choices that they are making now and have been making over these last number of years. We are seeing an economy that is clearly shifting as many industries that we are sort of identified as core to the United States are in uh, serious uh, difficulty. And that will be an important and long-term story of how we come out of the virus. And the effect of those industries being in trouble, real estate and the entertainment industry, the airline industry, and other travel agencies and industries remind us that we are likely to experience a period of time dependent on which economists you listen to in terms of how our economy will return to its robustness and health uh, that it had experienced earlier this past year. Hate in America itself is rising, as noted earlier in our conversation, but here more specifically, the longer term questions of how this will be manifested, not only in the 2020 elections, but how it will be explained and experienced as we move forward beyond this particular moment in time. Next slide, please. We are really reimagining the American Jewish experience, not so much only in the course of these weeks, but over the course of the last number of years. Many of the trend lines that I will be talking about have already been in play for a period of time. And it is my belief that what we are seeing is the accentuation, the expansion of these ideas as we move forward. Amongst those themes that we are seeing 
is the rise of family foundations and community foundations and the donor class, the mega donor class is being particularly significant in the last number of weeks and throughout the period of the last several years where increasingly we are seeing foundations playing a much higher profile in terms of their giving and their role in con as conveners and participants with federations and other institutions in redirecting the uh, focus of charity and community and organizing. I think this may be one of the core stories that we are experiencing, which is to suggest this shift of where economic power is in the Jewish community and how it will be manifest. I think we are also moving to a kind of collaborative culture. We have been living through a period of individualism, which was the dominant theme in American life for much of the last 25 years. We would recite or identify uh, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam as a case study of how America and its institutions were breaking apart and where individual ideas and the sovereign self had dominated the um, marketplace in so many different ways. But what we are seeing in the course of these past number of weeks is a, an extraordinary shift in terms of institutions working together, of organizations breaking down silos in order to create a different kind of culture of community, which may be the outcome of what we will see as we move beyond the virus and as we see our community shift some of its core ideas of how best to move forward. The new modalities of connectivity and learning would suggest, as this slide points out, that we may be living through the greatest moment of Jewish learning in history. We are seeing hundreds, if not thousands of Jews joining websites and webinars in the thirst for uh, both individual learning and collective experiences through a Jewish lens. And that is an exciting possibility for us to grow and develop as we have witnessed this moment in time where synagogues, agencies, and community organizations are reporting increased numbers of participants in uh, these virtual uh, community sites. How we will define community going forward will be part of this uh, story. In some measure, what I think we are seeing is as these individual factors of collective, of a collaborative culture, of the use of the virtual community, of the creation of new engines and forms of financial expression by major donors and fund, funding streams, um, that will help in part to shape the kind of community models that we may be looking at as we move forward. I think that the new Jewish economy will be leaner, but in certain ways it will be stronger. That is, we have witnessed over the past 40 years the development really of two economies in the Jewish world. The legacy institutions, our synagogues, denominations, national agencies, and federated organizations as part of that tradition that is more than 125 years old. And they, along with the emergence since the mid-1980s of boutique organizations, single issue groups that have emerged and have played a significant role on the Jewish scene, whether they were political or Israel-based or cultural or educational, these boutique institutions were the new expression of Jewish participation from 1985 um, till the present. The question will be how these two institutional frames, the legacy groups and these boutique organizations find common ground. In reality, the Jewish community of uh, the 21st century is a 19th century invention, living with a 20th century agenda, having to deal now with a 21st century new reality. In my writings, I point to the fact that I think we will see a 21st century Judaism that will be in part vi virtual as we have described, but it will also feature a series certainly of institutional models that will be uh, framed around the groups that are able and willing to understand these new realities of limited economic resources, of fewer Jews able and willing to participate, and of a community that has been under 
a good amount of change for these past 20 years and now is seeing all of this come to the reality of a different kind of expression and participation of Jewish life. This is no longer the individualized, privatized Judaism that we would see um, in, in our communities. It is increasingly going to depend on the collective will and engagement of people to realize that we are in a different place demographically, culturally, and financially. A piece of that story will be Israel and our relationship to it. It is under constant change and we will be experiencing another major challenge to our community and to the Israel diaspora relationship next, in the next several months as the issues of annexation become very much a part of the current government's agenda and the implications of that for American Jewish audiences and how that will be received by Israel's enemies as well as its friends will be a challenging question that the Jewish community will need to be prepared to address. Next. I think that what we at the end uh, are really living with is a fundamental um, period in which we will go through a series of stages. There will be obviously an element of recovery but we will also be losing certain components of our communal system. I do not believe that it will be possible to ensure the viability of every Jewish institution that came into this experience. As we come out of it, I believe that there will be periods of dislocation and loss. I also, as I have noted earlier, believe that we will be experiencing a significant amount of uh, hate in our society and disruption, and that we have to be prepared for as we plan for these new stages and fundamentally a, a new beginning. I think that we can learn a great deal from other moments in which the Jewish community has experienced fundamental changes. In part, the First World War and certainly the 1980 pandemic was one of those. The Great Depression was a second of those models. A third was actually the period of the immediate post Second World War, where much of the American Jewish story that we know was created, nurtured, and developed from the period of 1945 moving forward. The suburban growth of which Westchester County is certainly a critical piece was very much born, nurtured, and developed in that post-war era. I think that there is a lot of emotional, psychological, and even physical um, challenges coming out of this experience. Therapists and psychiatrists are sh shedding increasing information on the fact that there is a good deal of um, concerns about po po um, po populations within our society uh, that are dealing with loneliness, uh, facing uh, isolation, and concerned about um, their well-being, both physical and, and uh, psychological, as we move beyond the virus. And this is a challenge as well for our community in terms of helping folks adjust to this new moment in time as we come uh, forward. I think that hygienic fascism, as has been identified in the press, is the notion of this balance that we are going to be living with for some time between the power of the state and the rights and roles and liberties of the individual. And these questions, along with how much emergency powers should and ought the state uh, to appropriate, are challenges uh, to many in our community and across the country in terms of understanding this critical balance between science and medicine and certainly the individual's rights and liberties. One of the elements that is not unique to this moment is the fact that America itself is an aging society. Along with Europe and Japan, we are amongst now the oldest societies in the world. But the Jewish community must take specific note of this uh, demographic reality. We are the single oldest white ethnic community in the United States, with 26% of our community over the age of 65. 
we have a relatively small base of younger Jews, uh, but this is a part of the uh, reality of the American story, which transcends the virus, but points to the demographic challenges that are ahead. Islam will replace Judaism as America's third major religious community. Protestant, Catholic are the uh, dominant ones, of course. And Islam in uh, the uh, 2040s will replace Judaism by um, the numbers of Muslims in America in comparison to Jewish Americans. The reality is that America itself is going through a huge amount of change. And by the mid years of this uh, century, by 2050, the United States will no longer be a white majority society as our country's demographics reveal a major shift in how the United States will see itself as a multi-ethnic uh, community. There are some writers, including Joel Kotkin and others who are demographers about American cities, who are suggesting that American cities are in uh, the sort of end phase of their development and growth as major centers of life. Part of this is driven by what we are experiencing at this moment, but part of it is the changing realities of uh, opportunities for young families. And we can report in Los Angeles County, for example, and various counties in Southern California, an out-migration of Jews, along with others, to other localities in the South and Southwest. And we um, are looking at some of that same data in the Northwest and in the Northeast, in terms of whether or not cities such as Seattle in the Northwest or New York and Boston in the Northeast are showing similar patterns of outmigration of younger families, the cost of living, the high density of the population, the challenges of traffic and uh, pollution, and lifestyle choices on the part of younger um, demographics would suggest this outmigration uh, uh, pattern. We are also certainly seeing the changing threats to the middle class. And this is important to the Jewish community because the Jewish community des describes and defines itself primarily as part of the middle class. Yet the middle class in the United States is clearly um, facing huge challenges. These are in part because the jobs that drove the economy to allow us to be part of that class structure are beginning to disappear. And whether or not they will be replaced in a fast enough uh, framework to permit uh, opportunities for younger people to uh, achieve the same levels of income or surpass those of their parents is the single major criteria of how we would measure the future of the middle uh, class. We are also seeing um, other realities, including the loss of trust in institutions. There has been a profound downsizing over the past 20 years of trust in churches and synagogues and religious leaders, in government figures, in the Congress, the su Supreme Court, and the presidency of the United States. And that is particularly challenging to a minority community, especially one that believes very strongly in the political model of democracy and liberty that this nation represents. And by witnessing and the experiencing this downsizing of trust um, is really a, a moment of concern to a number of us who study political behavior. If a minority community believes uh, that the majority no longer sees the value of government or the importance of religious life and institutions, that is particularly challenging um, to our own interests and to the betterment of the larger society. Governance will be a huge question, not only in the 2020 election as to how well we did during this period, but it will raise questions beyond that in terms of the kind of public policies we will need in managing climate change and dealing with science and in de de determining the kind of medical um, regimes we will require to prevent further such moments as this and to be prepared in ways to deal with this. In planning for the Jewish future, it will require us to think about these larger issues because as American Jews, we are so deeply embedded in the larger culture that we cannot simply think in terms of a specific Jewish sets 
set of needs, but must also uh, consider these uh, larger socioeconomic issues as central to our concerns. As I begin to close out my presentation, I want to show you this last slide um, where I am posing a set of questions to you and to your community that I think we need to address. So I wonder if you could uh, bring up the last slide in, in this uh, PowerPoint. In that slide, I introduce four questions uh, where I ask the community to think about these issues. They are questions that I think are particularly important for this moment, including the first one, which is memorializing this moment. For us to better, have a better understanding of what it may mean and how it ought to be understood and what kind of cultural artifacts will we have following this experience. But far more important for us is the kind of leadership that we will require and the kinds of institutions that we will need inside the Jewish community. What does adaptive leadership mean for us in this post uh, coronavirus era? And what role do we see our Jewish community playing both within the community, but also in terms of the broader social values and priorities of this nation? We will experience change and loss as I've tried to identify and here we need to also take a look at the difficult questions, the emotional, the physical, the financial ones, in terms of assisting others at this moment and beyond, as well as to understand what the idea of community will be following the, the coronavirus in terms of how we have changed and what values we bring to the table in terms of what communal life may represent or mean. And finally, as I have repeatedly suggested in this presentation, I worry greatly about the sort of character of the society in terms of how it will deal with the issues of hate and anti-Semitism, and as a community, how well prepared we need to be and must be in being responsive to these challenges, both as it affects the state of Israel, but more directly as it affects the American uh, society. I look forward to your comments, your questions, and I'm certainly willing to expand upon some of the ideas that have been introduced at this time. Thank you. Super, thank you so much, Dr. Wernmuller. Um, I have a few questions that have been put in the chat box, which we'll get to in a moment. If uh, Now that you've heard and seen the gist of the issues that we're talking about, if, uh, if everybody can, can, if you have any other questions, please put them in there and we'll get to them and we'll try to get to them. <clears throat> and I have a list of them also. For some reason, I'm huge on my version of the Zoom and I'm trying to stop that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so uh, we are kicking off, this, this event tonight is a kickoff, we hope, um, as we, as WJC, take on an additional role of trying to work together to envision the future move, you know, not, not move away from all of the incredibly important tactical issues that we deal with today, but to add this as another layer and invite you all to participate in it. To that end, I would suggest that the four questions or the four issues that were on that slide just now, uh, that last slide, our new story for compelling issues, are really, you know, the gist of what we, what we need to be working on. So, uh, I will, we will be inviting you to come together and, and work on these specific issues and, and you know, um, as a group, as a community together. So, uh, warning, you will get, you will hear from us on that and we, will, we can't move, we can't do anything without all of us together working on it together. So, um, Stephen, the first thing, because there's a couple of questions here uh, we should, we should um, get to first and then I have some, I have some more. Uh, in different directions, and hopefully there's some more coming. Um, and otherwise, you can take us forward on whatever you think is most important to this conversation. So, um, Betsy, thank you, Betsy. I'm going to read your first question, and then the second question is a combo question. So the first one is, can you be more specific patterns you see emerging among Gen Z and millennials? What are they doing differently? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh 
in some of the writings that um, we are seeing, <clears throat> not just at this moment, but have seen already for the past uh, eight to 12 years, is the focus on three uh, core areas. Um, many younger uh, folks that fit into this age, these age cohorts are in fact um, spending far more time living with parents or friends because the cost of housing and uh, the difficulty of uh, job opportunities has sort of uh, limited some of their ability to move forward with their careers and, and lifestyle. So this creates a different sort of staging of uh, leaving home marrying or becoming involved in larger circles of community and uh, group activities. And so the first issue here is, is the, the sort of social behaviors we're seeing. The second is that these generational types have increasingly demonstrated uh, their interest to link together their values with their lives and their work. They, they are not prepared to sort of live hyphenated lives. They want to see their lives as having a coherence uh, to it that gives them meaning uh, both in their work as well as in their uh, involvement in recreational social um, causes and community um, development. And that is an important uh, expression because for them, cohesive lifestyles that have meaning and character um, is a dominant theme in much of the research uh, of these particular uh, communities. A third sector is the fact that they are called religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, for a very re real reason. They are not belonging. They are not joiners in much of the communal systems that we have uh, created and established. And while once married and in terms of having the opportunity to educate children in day schools, religious schools, and other parts of Jewish expression. Um, they have um, certainly responded, but generally late and with far fewer numbers. The reality here is that they do not necessarily see the institutions of their parents and grandparents as their institutions. And therefore there is a greater reluctance to simply adopt and engage those kinds of models as theirs. And as a result, we are frequently seeing alternative forms of community expression and community engagement uh, by and for that constituency. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that. Um, you know, we, there's a huge shift. I don't know what your community is like in Los Angeles, but here, you know, we have a relative, we've had a relatively small population of kids after they leave high school and until they marry and, and have families and come back to Westchester. We've had this hu relatively huge void of that population that we're talking about. And now they're back. You know, they're back, I don't know for how long. Um, we don't know whether they're going back to the city, whether they're moving somewhere. I mean, where, you know, what do you think our opportunity is? And, you know, you're the visionary. Where, where are we headed on this? Because this is a moment of opportunity, it seems, to grab onto doing something for this community, for that community. Well, in a sense, maybe the question has to be reversed in terms of understanding what their desires, their needs, and their vision of their lives reflect. The other piece to this is that I believe because of the changing environment of the economy, we are likely to see people on the move, looking to go to places where there are jobs and where there are going to be new economic possibilities. So as much as we may want to hold on to them, part of this is as much about the economic possibilities and choices that are available to them. And as I've noted, um, this, this is uh, something that uh, we are watching carefully as we see out-migration of younger folks in some metropolitan areas. The other interesting piece is that we are finding huge numbers of young folks in sort of the new communities. And new communities are not just part of the United States, but they are global. So Berlin is an extraordinary example of where we find lots of young Israelis Americans and Europeans, Russians, experiencing the opportunities of, uh, of the German society and, and economy. 
We see it in Singapore, we see it in Shanghai, we see it in Hong Kong, we see it in various uh, places where there are and have been over the last uh, several decades, new possibilities and opportunities economically for that group. The Silicon Valley has basically priced itself out for many younger family uh, types and has made it difficult for those workers to even stay and live in the uh, San Jose and Silicon Valley uh, areas. But it's an important reality that I think the economy drives the demography at this moment. Thank you. Um, that I, it wasn't a, I, I didn't even think that way in terms of losing that group of, of millennials to outside, not only outside of our community, but outside of our country where, you know, our reach is not going to be able to impose our Jewish organizational structure on them at all. Um, next question. Does anybody have, if you have anything on that issue, uh, type it back in if you wouldn't mind. Uh, I'll read Michelle's. Thank you, Michelle, for, for typing this in. Has charitable giving from Jews shifted away from Jewish organizations to donating more towards general needs like food and medicine? And then Betsy added, building off Michelle's comments and the recovery, dislocation, hate, loss, new beginnings thought, what are your thoughts about synagogue affiliations versus some of the newer boutique causes you referenced earlier? Are synagogues in crisis during and as a result of this dislocation period? Well, there are obviously a series of questions here. Um, we'll try to see if we can help cover um, the different pieces. Um, Charitable giving is particularly difficult to measure at the moment uh, because of the crisis. Um, we do see an uptake in terms of what I guess we would describe as immediate needs, uh, hunger, homelessness, um, and, and uh, uh, job creation possibilities. Uh, that seems to be the central focus at the moment uh, by many different uh, sources confirming that. How that will play out as we move forward in terms of what will be the immediate response of donors, especially the larger donor, the mega donor groups and the major Jewish and non-Jewish foundations, that will be the challenge. Uh, I think that the initial period will continue to be around the most vulnerable in our society, Jewish and otherwise. And by the way, within that category, which I did not reference, are are significant numbers of Orthodox Jews who live at or below the poverty line. And I don't have your data for Westchester, but elsewhere in the United States, the data is quite stark and uh, revealing in terms of that community facing some particular challenges in terms of uh, their economic position. The synagogue community, which is the other part of the question, has up till this point been competing, frankly, with boutique and other kinds of expressions in Jewish life. And I have no clue, of course, in Westchester, whether or not you have a significant sort of boutique presence or whether or not uh, you have more traditional denominational and, and community-based agencies with the uh, boutique models in the city and, and potentially in Brooklyn, but may not necessarily be present in parts of Westchester. But the synagogue community is, is going to face some extraordinary challenges. Uh, the uh, first issue is the term membership, dues, and affiliation. Here we come to the crux of many of the challenges synagogues are facing. They have been for some period of time experimenting with different dues models. Others are looking at different types of affiliation and, and uh, connection whether or not they require or want to be part of umbrella systems, whether United Synagogue or the Union for Reform Judaism or any other expression of a particular denominational um, engagement. And that will be the challenge of the sort of liberal or uh, progressive congregations moving forward, how they balance their economic interests and needs against the pressures to be part of a larger a corporate or, or um, umbrella system, as well as the challenge of keeping members who may face new economic and, um, and financial stress and may not be able to afford synagogue membership, uh, day school uh, 
enrollment uh, costs and, and tuition. And that will be increasingly an issue that as a community and as a collective entity, I'm sure you all will be exploring how to um, sort of deal with the challenges ahead of sustaining uh, and the viability of, of some of our synagogues and ensuring that if that isn't always possible, how there can be a kind of collaborative culture of where synagogues working together may be able to overcome some of these uh, financial and uh, demographic realities. I, I think that um, th th we are seeing, as we've seen already in a number of national news stories, um, that the question of the future of the American synagogue and the religious institutions in American life will be um, front and center in terms of how we sustain and grow and at least retain um, some of these core elements uh, so core to the history of the American Jewish experience. And uh, I, I think that's one of the questions that I think as, as your futurist task force looks ahead, this will be an issue that will be uh, of particular importance to a suburban uh, communities such as the communities of Westchester. Absolutely, and we are, um, I, would, I would suggest, I, Elliot or whoever one might want to correct me, but I would suggest that we do lean very far towards the traditional side and that these are the issues that we're, we've been confronting and they're just rising and you know, there was, this was a catalyst. So, there, uh, by the way, there, yeah. there's some fascinating data from the 2011 uh, Jewish population study of New York and Westchester included in that study where Stephen Cohen noted and where I believe the data, at, at least from that study, confirms a particularly high affiliation pattern for Westchester and the New York uh, community with synagogues, much higher than what we are seeing elsewhere in the United States. And I'm, I think that more traditional communities of the Northeast, the Midwest, reflect that. Here in the South and Southwest, we are seeing a significant decline in synagogue affiliation or participation, a real challenge uh, to Phoenix and to the synagogues here in Los Angeles, San Diego, and elsewhere in the Southwest, because uh, there, in, in the data we have of this part of the country, those numbers are, are really uh, particularly challenging uh, to the future of synagogue life. And have you seen, um, have you seen a community in those areas that has figured out what a potential future looks like in a new model? I mean, I know that's like the, the crystal ball, but... Mm -hmm. it, it's difficult because we've seen some efforts at creating these kind of mega synagogues, similar to the churches, the mega church world that we've seen, uh, where these synagogues have huge resources and significant size membership. And they are able to withstand some of the pressures of this moment. Uh, we are seeing small and more importantly, intermediate sized synagogues that are really in trouble because they are not large enough on the one hand to have a significant endowment or alternative funding streams or systems of uh, resources such as um, camps or um, other uh, funding streams that are central, uh, now much more central to synagogue life. Uh, and those synagogues uh, seem to be uh, more challenged at the moment. Uh, what we are now suggesting and what I think has become increasingly the model is that the synagogues to survive in the, in the foreseeable future will need multiple streams of income. They cannot depend exclusively on a dues nor necessarily on school tuition, but may require alternative income streams. And that is a challenge to create those in an economy which is already um, very much uh, disrupted. What kind of streams are you even thinking about? Are you talking about like rental income from, or so, something so more yes. creative than so that? So you have synagogues uh, in various parts of the country and certainly here uh, that operate cemeteries that have um, their own camp systems that have properties that they are earning uh, income from um, that have um, secured other forms of 
of resources by building their endowment. So to suggest that we can simply go forward without some of those alternative income streams uh, may be the major challenge for especially small to intermediate synagogues who may have only one or at best two uh, income uh, sources. Got it. Um, Elliot and Pam, you turned on your cameras. I don't know if you wanted to jump in on this question or if I should read the next question. No, good, okay. Uh, Jane, Jane says, Jane Silverman, I am very concerned about the rise in anti-Semitism both from both the right and the left, but I wonder about the internal divisions within the Jewish community, especially around Israel, and our ability to move forward and have a communal response. And I just wanted to add one piece that occurred to me that's somewhat related, which is the interesting aspect that the, the college campuses are closed, giving the the aggressive um, voice on the college campuses, no voice right now, I don't think. So I was just curious if, you know, if that was in, in this picture as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm suggesting or might suggest that at least some of the um, anti-Zionist BDS kinds of responses at this time are minimized because of this um, uh, inability to organize and be on campus to mobilize. Um, but at the same time, um, social media has become the new and clear vehicle for much of the hate-driven messaging that we are seeing. And to uh, Jane's question about the great divide in the Jewish community, I think, uh, sadly, this is, um, you know, it's, it's not t today's story. It has unfortunately been a storyline we are living with in terms of our partisan divisions, our views on Israel and divisions, and our, even our ideological differences about our Jewish expressions of, of engagement and participation. Uh, all of these contribute to this sort of uh, difficulty of dialogue within the Jewish community. So I'm going to suggest something that some of us are trying to push elsewhere in the country, which is it's about time that American Jews start talking to the folks that they are not talking to, meaning the dinner table discussion that you would have with your former cousin or your um, sister-in-law, but are not having because you disagree on Donald Trump or you disagree about the state of Israel or you disagree about being a conservative Jew, an Orthodox Jew, um, whatever, and that those conversations have to be put on the table and that Jews have to sit at the table and that there are people today, thank thanks to efforts to create conversations where they are guided and led in ways that diffuse the tension and build to some degree of, I'm listening to you, and I want to understand your ideas, your perspectives, your beliefs. If we don't figure that out, uh, then this is particularly problematic at a time when the community already is bereft of so much of what it needs to, um, to manage its, its moving forward. So this is an interesting model to test in terms of building these conversations that need to be held. And uh, they should be held at the Shabbat table as they should be held at, at the boardroom table. We, WJC, um, at last spring, it's been a whole year, I guess, uh, we worked on a small pilot program around gun violence and brought people together in the room who were very surprised at each other's views, making assumptions about other people that weren't true, you know, about other people's views. And it was, um, it was eye opening. And, and it sounds like, you know, that's, that, that's the direction that you're suggesting is a role for us to bring people together and, uh, and let them voice their, their opinions that are assumed and may not be correct. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I had, oh, uh, let's see, Harriet. I am concerned about continued Jewish identity among our younger generations where there's a decrease in synagogue affiliation. Our Orthodox population self-select, but comprise only about 10% of American Jewry. How do we ensure future Jewish hearts and minds? Big question. <laughs> yes, I mean, that, that's a much longer one for a one minute response and a deserving one for an entire sort of seminar or, or conversation. 
and I think it begins with the notion that there are many ways to um, engage younger Jews and to, to carry forward the idea of, of Jewish identity as a, as, as, a, as a multiple layered expression. It is not a specific set of behaviors or outcomes, but that it reflects the fact that we have uh, so many different types of Jews in America and uh, that includes also Jews of color, Jews of choice, meaning many of us or others of us have come to Judaism by choice. Um, and we need to uh, embrace the opportunities uh, to realize that there are many of these avenues for expression. One of the places where lots of this gets played out and having been quite successful at it has been Jewish camping and informal Jewish grouping, meaning youth movements and social connectivity as, as the starting point. Uh, because we have always understood that learning begins um, really in the classroom. I think it ultimately should lead to the classroom, but I think it begins, frankly, in the framework of creating these sort of uh, informal opportunities for participation and connection. And joyful, it grows, and joyful and fun Judaism versus educated, <coughs> educating on Judaism. And this in no way minimizes the importance of serious and significant Jewish learning, but it has to be framed in a context where people are open to it. So what do you think the impact is on our loss of youth groups and Jewish camping this summer? Is it long term or can we recover from it? I think if it's only one season, I think we'll be okay because some of the camps to their credit and to some of the youth movements to their credit have been doing extraordinary programming and will continue this summer, uh, the virtual model and through other means to sort of keep community alive and to build as much of the social networking you can do with this model. I mean, I was on a program a few weeks ago for BBYO, which had 5,000 people wow. tuning in. And it tells you that people are, are certainly willing to um, participate if what they are being offered is something challenging and interesting, engaging, and even potentially controversial. That's exciting. Yeah, the opportunities, the, the, <clears throat> the volume of people attending mm -hmm. events that would typically you know, draw dozens or hundreds and, and a drawing, of that, drawing of thousands are, are just a shock to the system. Like this is the new world that there's great interest. So to that point, um, on the statistics of <clears throat> newly religious in, that have popped up, that people are, you know, connecting, they're not being sick to some sort of savior. I mean, you, you can go into this. So all the, these statistics about all these newly religious, can we keep them or is this a blip? And they're just, you know, they're gonna make it through the virus and then they're gonna be at, back to nuns or whatever they are. Uh, I was speaking today earlier with um, several of my former students who are rabbis in various communities and congregations and hearing their stories about uh, the kinds of engagements and relationships that have evolved during this period from funerals to weddings to bar and bat mitzvahs that are virtual to other uh, you know, experiences that are happening. And um, the sentiment of the call and amongst these young uh, rabbinic voices was something really interesting. They said, this is a moment that many of these young people will not forget. This is so out of the ordinary. This is so unique to their lives having their parents in their lives daily, having the opportunity to experience something with their rabbi that is unique and virtual, but could be very emotional and, and spiritual and in, engaging in, in a different way. And uh, this possibility that um, the uh, American Jewish religious model may be evolving to suggest that what we are experiencing now has some possibilities for continuing. And the moments experienced here will be important moments in the lives and the memories of, of the folks that are 
uh, be being a part of that that encounter. So on that note, <clears throat> what do you think about the whole conversation about national service and what is the Jewish community's potential role in helping to build that or whatever the role is? Like, is yes. there a role? Well, part of this is a gap year, and we're going to see a significant number of uh, students who are not able to return to their universities and colleges as um, living in dorms or being part of the, a sort of a live and in-person experience, uh, possibly using this uh, for this gap year learning and uh, some other possibilities. And uh, to the credit of several of these projects that are Jewishly driven, to use this opportunity to do programming both here for social justice in Israel, in terms of an Israel education and Israel studies, or in terms of other kinds of um, models of, of really putting these folks in, in taking the opportunity of this year and what it may mean um, to create some um, uh, extraordinary uh, experiences in their lives that would, they would not have had. So, one piece is the gap year, and we will be watching how many and in what kinds of uh, sort of models we will see play out for Jewish and other kids. And by the way, one of the things we have to do here is not just look at our community in terms of measuring what works for, for um, uh, Jewish audiences, but what's working generally that can be applied to the Jewish community. And that is a really important, important part of the, this experience is who is successful and what were the ingredients that made for success and how much of that is transportable both over time, meaning beyond the virus and how much of it is transportable in a Jewish context, whatever that may look is like. That, is that research being done or is that something that you're suggesting that we take well, on? Well, it's something I'm suggesting and I'm trying to push some of my younger colleagues to take a serious mm -hmm. look at, at various models of who's really out there already trying to, to devise and um, reinvent, in a sense, uh, institutions and ideas that can be sort of brought, brought down into, into community practice. Uh, but it's something we, we need to look at, for sure. It's also Absolutely. about leadership, by the way. Um, Say more. <laughs> who are the leaders already that really are impressive in terms of the adaptability? And that's why I use the term adaptive leadership and which Wexner Foundation, the um, wonderful yeah. Jewish foundation that's doing a lot of training of, of young uh, Jewish leaders and serving and working with our community, um, is, is all about this adaptive model that leadership is about um, you know, taking the new realities and instead of letting them overcome you, you figure a way to sort of um, maneuver and manage the the world around you in terms of creating uh, what needs to be accomplished. So this adaptive leadership style and approach is what I think a lot of us are trying to look at in terms of how certain corporate leaders are leading, how certain political elites are working, how some religious folks within American Protestantism and the Catholic world and elsewhere are managing and even our uh, our Jewish educators, rabbis, and communal professionals in terms of who's really getting ahead in terms of figuring out ways to mobilize people, create a sense of vision and direction, and has a sort of outcome as to where they want to go in terms of helping people achieve um, certain objectives and visions. It sounds somewhat daunting. There's, there's massive amount of new thinking and, and pilot activity going yeah. on. And is there, is there good research being done? I mean, is, so that it's easy to manage or is, what are you doing for us in this? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of us are trying to sort of look at all the different outcomes or behaviors that we're seeing and figure out, is this the way to go? And uh, what, can we, what can we take away for the Jewish community that will be helpful and insightful. And, it's I mean, like kind of like managing the COVID information. Like it's coming so fast, but it's not enough information to make decisions on yet. Exactly, exactly. So it's, we're, we're really a bit early, 
but I think it's important to take a look out there and see what's happening and to sort of see um, what the questions are that people are trying to address, because uh, that tells us a lot about uh, what they think are the core issues we're we're going to be struggling with. Now, I you know I've introduced here three or four themes in that uh, last panel of of questions. They may be helpful, but they may not be the right ones for for Westchester or for um, our community as we move the next step forward, but at least it's a starting point to think about um, what what the agendas need to be. Absolutely, it'll get us to the table and have us start talking. Um, on a different note, we have just a few more minutes. Um, you talked about, we, we have a very active, we do, WJGC does an enormous amount of really fabulous work on security, sadly. That, you know, that's been where our, our heads have been for the last year or two years, whatever. So you, you know, there's an issue of rising hate and you touched on it um, beyond the normal security. Where, w can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, where are we and what, what should we be working on? Not, not just so tactical, but more, more strategically. Well, I, I'm going to suggest we start um, with public education, uh, meaning uh, that what we are seeing is that folks who have no knowledge of the history of communities, of minorities, of culture, who are sort of devoid of understanding what was the Holocaust? Um, what is Ramadan? What are the challenges facing Hispanics uh, coming into our communities? Um, the point being that education um, is still the central vehicle for at least minimizing and um, minimizing hate and maximizing uh, understanding. It does not guarantee certain behaviors or outcomes, but it is the first step. So part of that is the never again legislation that just passed the Senate and had already been approved by the House uh, which has $200 million associated with it in its four public schools to teach about genocide and Holocaust. And it is being managed and supported by the um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as the partner in this with the United States government. <clears throat> and this is for high schoolers uh, to be mandated to study about the history of genocide and Holocaust. And only 12 states in the United States, for example, have requirements associated with this kind of study. So it's now the job to sort of bring this kind of learning into the systems of American education. <clears throat> awesome. That's, that's really helpful. That's a model of what I'm trying to sort of focus on, which is why I believe education is step one. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have... Well, two minutes left. I'm going to ask one more question that was in the, which is a big question, and maybe you can give a sort of a short answer to it, and then I'm going to turn it over to Elliot or Lisa to wrap it up. Um, the question was, how well poised do you think the Jewish community is to rise to these challenges? Just a little question. <laughs> we have been always a community that has managed crisis well, in part uh, I credit the federation system. Uh, federations were created in the 1880s moving forward and were designed in part to deal with all the challenges facing uh, building an American Jewish community, responding to the challenges to Jews in the, uh, in the United States, but across the world. And therefore the history of community has been all about the success that, um, the system has has had. So principle one is we are sadly comfortable with and knowledgeable about managing issues of Jews in crisis or communities in crisis. The second thing is you more than any other part of the United States have both experienced parts of the worst of this moment in, in the uh, virus and its impact on your community and the greater New York uh, metropolitan area. And it was your community as well in uh, twenty uh, in two thousand and one 
9-11, the way you were directly uh, impacted. I think that um, of all of the pieces of this story, um, the uh, experience we are having now and that we have had in previous moments in, 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 our, in our history uh, make us actually one of the most <clears throat> flexible, viable, and um, ex accessible communities in terms of managing these kinds of issues. Um, part of that is because we have professionals who are committed to leading us, lay leaders who have devoted their resources, time, and energy to guide us, and the institutions that have the technology and skills and experience to support us. I think we're actually in that sense in a very good place. How we sort of pivot and adjust, that will be uh, how we will be measured and judged by history and by the moments of, of uh, how well we have tackled the great issues before us. And coming up on Shavuot, which begins tomorrow night, reminds us that this is, this is a moment in which I think uh, we realize that as a people, um, this, this is sort of a redeeming moment. This is sort of affirming our faith, affirming our community. And uh, I think, especially in a year in which we feel somewhat sort of bound up by all the pressures externally, um, this is a moment in a sense to celebrate uh, the uniqueness of our journey through time and place. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you, Stephen. That was a beautiful way to end with a sense of optimism and, um, and confidence that we, we can do this. And we always have for thousands of years. So it's just another moment of picking up the baton and, and, and moving forward. Um, thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, this was our kickoff. This was the beginning of obviously some really important, powerful conversations that are going to be a lot of fun because we're going to be able to think out of the box and create and do some research and some learning. And um, I, I hope you'll all join me and us. So um, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, Dr. Wimmiller. Ellie, do you want to say goodbye or wrap it up? Um, no, just thank you to everybody for your time. As um, doc, Dr. Wimmiller said, it's about a journey. And a journey begins with a single step. And, uh, and today is our single step, but it's not the only step. Uh, we look forward to working closely with our friends and colleagues at UJA, Tracy Bilski, Andy Rosenthal, who have done a fair amount of work in this area. Our work is gonna always be complimentary as we work together. And to each one of you, uh, even though it's only, it's summertime, and sometimes we think of summertime that we're gonna slow down. I know Jessica too well, and she does not slow down. She ramps up. So we're gonna ramp this thing up. We're gonna go and, um, and make the future really great because we deserve no less. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thanks for your time, everybody. Talk Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Winmuller. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Happy Shavuot. Thank you. Bye, Laurie. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.